I guess I was fairly apprehensive the whole time that I was flying in combat. And, and I guess there's good reason to feel that way. I'm there to cause a lot of damage and a lot of harm, and therefore they would like to damage me. And I was 25 years old at that time. Good afternoon, Moses Lake Air Show fans. We are joined by a special guest. We have Mark Peterson with us. Mark will be performing at the Moses Lake Air Show in this beautiful aircraft that you see behind him. This is the A37 Dragonfly. Mark, welcome. Thanks, Herb. Great to see you again. <laughs> Great to see you. Hey, I just saw you take this aircraft up and do a phenomenal demonstration. Uh, great job, buddy. Thank you. Um, tell us a little bit about the A-37. You were saying this this has got uh, some pretty interesting history. Yeah, the A-37 was developed by the U.S. Air Force as a, uh, a counterinsurgency aircraft, and it was developed from the T-37 trainer that the U.S. Uh, Air Force had used since the 50s for training uh, U.S. Air Force pilots. So they beefed it up, added a gun, put some hard points on it to carry bombs, and through a couple of iterations, they ended up with this aircraft called the A-37B Dragonfly. And uh, it's a great airplane. It's one of its most impressive qualities is that in combat configuration, it weighed about 6,300 pounds empty, and it could take off at 14,000 pounds. There aren't too many airplanes that can carry more than their empty weight off the ground, but this one could. Its specialty was to carry a lot of ordnance and a big gun up over a battlefield and sit and wait for a call from the ground for troops in contact or uh, close air support required. So its specialty was loitering and then bringing in a lot of firepower. This airplane was essentially the precursor to the A-10. This was used in Vietnam uh, from the late 60s to the early 70s. And the A-10, I don't know if you remember the history on that, it was developed right around 1970. First flew, I think, in 1972. So it's kind of the little brother of the A-10 Warthog. Interesting, interesting. So uh, you said that uh, recently you spoke to some uh, Vietnam veterans that, that flew the, the A-37 Yeah, one. one of the things I love about airplanes is, you know, flying them is a blast and showing them to people is a lot of fun, but the people I get to meet through the airplanes uh, are as much or even more fun and enjoyable and honorable. You know, it's just a huge honor to meet these guys that flew these airplanes in, the, in that terrible conflict. But yeah, I reached out and, and called pilots and said, hey, you used to fly the A-37 and just got get them talking. And they tell me some great stories about the airplane. They said, uh, for instance, the, the 30 caliber minigun in the nose sounds really impressive, but it's just not very good at penetrating jungle canopies and whatnot. So if you kept it, catch the enemy out in the open, it was a great weapon. But uh, the primary weapon they said they used was the bombs, because uh, bombs would go through the jungle and detonate down on the ground and do a lot more damage. Cool. Well, uh, saw you do uh a snippet of your demo today. Tell us a little bit about what we're going to see at Moses Lake June 18 and 19. Well, I'm going to try to show off the A-37's capabilities and how it was employed as a ground attack fighter. And one of the things that, that ground attack fighters are always facing is return fire from the enemy. And so the one thing you never want to do is stay stationary or present an easy target for small arms fire or shoulder you know, uh, missiles or any kind of things that could be thrown at you from the ground. This airplane didn't have the big titanium bathtub that the A-10 had. So all these guys had was maybe a flak jacket and a little bit of aluminum, <laughs> which wasn't good. So their big uh, uh, weapon against return ground fire was maneuverability. They could uh, jink and uh, maneuver and try to present the most difficult target possible. So what I'm going to show off is in this configuration where I'm so light, this thing has just an amazing amount of power. Pilots like to say there's no such thing as an overpowered airplane, but this thing gets really close. <laughs> and I'll show you how, how it takes off. You probably saw my takeoff here today. You know, it's, yeah, I climb it about a 35 to 40 degree deck angle, and it's just going, you know, <laughs> homesick angel, as they say. And then I'm going to show it's just maneuverability, its ability, its ability to accelerate, to slow down, to turn in very, very tight radius, and, uh, and do it all carrying a whole bunch of stuff on the wings. Very cool. Very cool. Now, uh, 
you've been flying air shows for a long time. You fly some some other aircraft as well. Yeah, I've been flying since I started flying air shows in 2007 and the P-51 Mustang. And I still fly that in air shows. I love it. I also have a Dornier Alpha Jet, which is also a ground attack fighter from the German Luftwaffe that was flown um, in the, let me see, started in about 1980 through 2000. And uh, it was very much like the A-10 as well, only it was a swept wing high speed fighter, uh, but carried a very big gun, carried a 30 millimeter cannon. So, um, uh, and then I've, now I'm just getting qualified to fly the uh, A-37 Dragonfly on show. So, I'll bring whatever anybody wants to a show. Uh, just let me know which airplane you want. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, Mark, appreciate you taking the time to visit with us today. We're very excited to see you at Moses Lake uh, just a little less than a month from today. Yeah, I'm excited to be back. It's a great show site, you know, with that great big runways and all the history there at the base and everything that's happened at, at Moses. It's just, it's nice to be returning there and, and, uh, and kind of just walking around and absorbing that again, soaking it up. Great. Great. Well, folks, that's Mark Peterson, the A-37 Dragonfly. You'll get to see him along with uh, our other performers and static displays. That's June 18th, 19th. Uh, tickets are on sale now. You can go to moseslakeairshow.com. And in the National Guard until 1990, there has been The A-37 has almost three times the thrust of the T-37. became one of the best known and accurate attack squadrons in Vietnam. Dragonfly could carry 100 tons. on the wingtips also exhibit something that's worth mentioning from an aerodynamic standpoint the wingtips and any wing generating lift creates a vortex at the wingtip 
and that curls around and you can see how that curls around and you may have noticed there was even a, a ring of smoke from that. But from the left, get your cameras on this as we get ready for a photo pass of Mark Peterson. Dragonfly. What a what a rare airplane as it approaches to land. On behalf of the entire Dragonfly team, Mark wants to thank all of you and all of the volunteers who made this show happen. And they want to thank the entire community for coming out today. Mark says he looks forward to seeing you again. Come in and hose them down one more time. Take me just north of the down pilot. Uh, Roger, Sandy One. Uh, we've got the down pilot sight. We're coming in from your six o'clock at this time. And then uh, we've got quite a bit of ground fire on here, so until we exactly get point, we're going to have to. Uh... Okay, Don, I think we can go for it. This is just small arms. We can move him in along the ridge line. Okay, babes, let me know I'm coming in. Uh -huh. Hello, Gun Fighter 82 Alpha. 82 Alpha, Sandy One. Okay, bravo, bravo. Pop your smoke, pop your smoke. Okay, Charlie, 10 degrees more right, 10 degrees more right. Smoke, straight ahead, smoke, straight ahead. Charlie, 5, 6, Sandy, 1, go. All right, Sandy, they want you to pull back to the west. They got some uh, bigs coming in in the uh, area. Roger, copy that. Get out on the deck. I advise all chargers, get on that deck. Watch for those bigs. Watch for shoots. Where's the big? Oh no, shoot. He's done. Get down. Bitch, bitch. John Green 7, watch Ben hit. Five, get down, choppers. Bitch, bitch. That was a big with the rocket. Uh, 7 2 is here. It passed B, got 7 0. Wipe him out. Well, I'm sitting right on top down here. The rocket was passed to my right and hit 7 0. It's a ball of flame. They're trying to possibly put any survivors out of that one. Charlie 3 0, I'm over position now. Over position now, breaking right. Okay, Charlie, 10 degrees more right, 10 degrees more right. Smoke straight ahead, smoke straight ahead. Uh, Charlie 3 0, this is Sandy 1 on Victor. Let's get out here. Okay, we got him up. Coming up. They got him up, Lee. Coming up. Let's get the f out of here. Sky Raider is a brute, a hulk, big, a bulky body, long, wide, straight wings, and just one powerful engine, the same engine used on the B-29 bomber. That big engine allowed the plane to carry freakish weapons loads, more than the World War II B-17 bomber and four times the ordnance on the P-51 Mustang. 
Not all missions lasted this long, but the A-1 could stay aloft for as long as 10 hours. And thanks to those long, wide wings, uh, could maneuver at low speeds. To protect the pilots, extra steel plating was added to the cockpit area. The Sky Raider was nicknamed the SPAD after the French World War I fighter that was flown by many American pilots. Eddie Rickenbacker became an ace and Medal of Honor recipient flying the SPAD over France and Germany. Sky Raider first established itself in combat in 1950 in the Korean War, attacking rail yards, factories, and protecting troops on the ground. Even with great pilots flying a great airplane, there are always losses, men and planes. In Korea, 128 A-1s and many crews were lost. Next came Vietnam. The Navy SPADs flew in the very first attack on North Vietnam, August 5, 1964, from aircraft carriers in the Tonkin Gulf. The targets were fuel depots at Vinh. The Air Force also flew the SPAD in various roles in Vietnam. They hunted truck convoys on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They flew close air support and dramatic life-saving Sandy missions, they were called, flying cover for rescues of threatened and injured troops on the ground. Again, there were losses in Vietnam. 266 A-1 SPADs and 144 pilots were lost. The Navy's last Vietnam missions were in 1968. The Air Force continued to fly the SPAD until the war ended. The Sky Raiders retired now. Some say it was the most effective ground support aircraft ever. Two American aviators join us today. Both flew the SPAD in Southeast Asia. John Goldenbaum is a retired United States Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. He served 20 years active duty, including two tours in Vietnam, 608 combat hours. He earned numerous decorations, including the Distinguished Flying Cross, 11 Air Medals, and more. John commanded the famous 71st Tactical Fighter Squadron at Langley Air Force Base. As a civilian, he continues to use aviation to connect and work with at-risk young people. Last year, here at Warbirds, John shared his Vietnam SPAD experiences and joins us today to highlight another SPAD pilot's dramatic A-1 record in skies over Southeast Asia. He is Roger Youngblood, also a retired United States Air Force officer who served 24 years active duty he logged 4,000 flight hours in 12 different types of aircraft. He is highly decorated with 48 Air Service medals, including four Distinguished Flying Crosses and four Meritorious Service medals. He was a program manager and a test pilot for the A-10 F-16 joint program, Chief of Air Operations in Korea, and advisor to the United States Air Operations Thailand. Roger and a fellow pilot saved four A-1 SPADs for history. One of those four planes currently airworthy in the United States is on the ramp today. Tail number 139606.
afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm David Hartman. And please, oh my gosh, thank you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Please welcome our guests, Roger Youngblood, Ken Holston, I'll introduce you to in just a moment, and Jay Goldenbaum. Jay, where are you? There's Jay down here that you just saw in the video. Gents, enjoy. So hi, everybody. This is one of the most remarkable, dramatic stories of thousands of them, actually, from the Vietnam period. Um, Ken Holston uh, is an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel retired also, highly decorated, has 187 combat missions, but they were flown later in Bosnia, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And Ken joins us. He flew six, which is 606, I can't tell. Here's 606. He flew this airplane in, so it would be here today. Ken, welcome to the, to the trio. Thanks, David. You know, the number one question we get about these airplanes and the history is, what were U.S. Air Force pilots doing flying propeller-driven former Navy carrier-based attack airplanes in the jet age in a place called Vietnam? <laughs> and to truly answer that question, you sort of have to take a step back in time and knock some rust off of uh, some world geography and some history and go to the end of World War II 1944-45, we'd won the war in Europe. We were taking the war to Japan and the home islands, and the B-29 Super Fortress was a technological marvel of its day. And one of the key points that made that airplane possible was the development of the Wright 3350 engine. Now, the Pentagon, fearing that we would have to actually invade Japan, went to the Douglas Company, which made some superior airplanes like the DC-3 and the SBD Dauntless dive bomber. The Pentagon went to Douglas and said, hey, we love the Dauntless, but now that we have this new 3350 engine available and we might have to invade Japan. Is that the engine, excuse me for interrupting, is that the same engine that we just heard about uh, that was on the B-29? Exactly, exactly. Wow. So that as we weave the story together, this is essentially the same basic engine that's on the B-29. And they said to Douglas, why don't we take that engine and build a successor to the Dauntless, we'll call it the Dauntless II. Douglas did that, they built a prototype, and it flew just a few more, a few months before the atomic bombs dropped and ended the war, preventing the need for that invasion. And... The war ended, of course, uh, with the dropping of the bombs. But the Pentagon liked the airplane so much, they put it into production. But instead of calling it Dauntless II, it became the Sky Raider. As World War II ended, of course, two of our uh, allies, Russia and China, chose to follow a communist path and quickly became enemies in the start of the Cold War. And that Cold War... Uh, lay dormant until the 50s started, and the heat began in a place called Korea. Uh, and interestingly, it was similar to what happened later in Vietnam, split down the middle with North and South, just as North and South Vietnam, but it was Korea in the early 50s. You're exactly right. Now, map is up on the jumbotron there on the other side of the globe. If you just want to do a quick refresher of your world geography with... Uh, uh, you see the Japan in between Russia and China. Korea is just to the left of that, so in the same neighborhood in Asia. And the Sky Raider was the primary ground attack airplane for the Navy and Marines, both flying off the ships and ground bases. Uh, many of you may have seen a movie, a great color movie from the 50s, called The Bridges at Toko Ri. While the stars of the movie were Grumman Panther jets, the, that's a little bit of a Hollywoodism. The real heroes of that movie or in, the, in, the, in the history books were the Sky Raiders that went in and actually took down those bridges. When that period of time ended, the uh, Pentagon looked back and said, wow, we have worn out our Sky Raider fleet. And while we would love, we love the silver screen version, we would love to build more jets. The truth is jets are not ready for prime time. They couldn't carry the load. They didn't have the fuel efficiency. And the uh, metallurgy in the engines just didn't allow the lifespan of the, en of the engine like the uh, good old SPAD. So the SPAD was put back into production, and several hundred more were built. 
in a production run from 54 to 57, and our 606 here was, is a 1955 model. Into the 60s, President Kennedy, of course, was in the White House, and one of the pillars of our foreign policy at that point, you may remember, called the domino theory. That was a concern that uh, if communism continued to try to spread its tentacles and knock down small countries one at a time, it could set a tumbling like dominoes and allow communism to spread. Ken, it's interesting when we get to this period, to the early 60s, we talk about this war as the Vietnam War, and yet there were many more countries involved than just the two Vietnams. That's exactly right. And on the uh, chart up there that we had earlier, when you zoom in on the area, we call it the Vietnam War, but it was really the Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and Thailand War. Uh, President Kennedy had hoped to keep us out of direct involvement, and we think of him as the father of special forces, the Green Berets, advisors that would go in and help the, uh, the indigenous folks of their own country help themselves. And lesser known is that the Air Force stood up a unit called the Air Commandos, which were sort of the equivalent of the Green Berets in the Air Force. Um, South Vietnam had been supplied with Sky Raiders uh, as early as 1960 and became the second largest operator of A1s in the world. Um, and the Air Force took over from the Navy working with the South Vietnamese in the early 60s flying missions using the E model. That's a two-seat version of this airplane where a U.S. pilot and a Vietnamese pilot could fly together. Where would those pilots train, the South Vietnamese pilots? I mean, as long a, and detailed and deep a process the, as that was, where would they train? The short answer is many of them came to America and did flight oh. training in the States and then went back to Vietnam yeah, to right. serve. Uh, that, that joint flying only lasted a couple years after the uh, Gulf of Tonkin incident. America then took on a frontline role in Vietnam and uh, flew the, uh, the multi-place A1E single pilot. Those airplanes were used up, and by this time into the mid to late 60s, jet technology did catch up, and the Navy was now able to build their ship squadrons using A4 Skyhawks, A7 Corsair IIs, and the single-seat Sky Raiders, like our 606 and H model, were now surplus, if you will. And the Air Force said, boy, we'll take all you'll give us. And they stood up four squadrons of single-seat, mostly single-seat so Sky So where Raiders. would they fly out of? Well, the three of the squadrons were in Thailand, uh, and one was in Vietnam. The uh, airplanes did a variety of missions, everything from forward air control, armed reconnaissance, close air support for troops, uh, more recently declassified support of Green Beret special operations teams, and then finally the most well-known mission, the search and rescue <coughs> mission where they used the call sign Sandy, went in to protect downed pilots and then protect the helicopters that went in to pick up those downed pilots. Under President Nixon and the Vietnamization program, we needed to reduce our footprint in Vietnam and began a slow withdrawal. So piecemeal remaining Sky Raiders were handed over to the South Vietnamese. And by the end of 1972, we had stopped operating, uh, Americans had stopped operating uh, Sky Raiders in South Vietnam. And the Vietnamese uh, were, were fighting on their own until the fall of South Vietnam in 1975. And the last part of the story really is that many of us have seen the uh, Discovery Channel footage that when South Vietnam fell and the tanks rolled in on the, uh, the embassy in, in the south, in Saigon, uh, folks clamored to escape, mostly using helicopters to fly out to the ships offshore and the <coughs> footages of the, the uh, decks being cleared, helicopters being pushed over the side to make room for more. Less documented was the escape of fixed-wing airplanes. Many of them went over to Thailand, and R-606 was, was used by a South Vietnamese pilot so to escape. So why were these airplanes sent over to Thailand? Thailand provided an ideal place for uh, the Sky Raiders and the Jolly Green Rescue helicopters to base out of because of the proximity of what's called the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Not just one trail, but really a network of thousands of paths and roadways 
that work down around Vietnam. And on one of the, the maps that you see there, you see that Vietnam is a very narrow country and our forces in Vietnam formed what you would call a roadblock. And what do we do when you come up against a roadblock? You go around it. And therefore the war f spilled over into Laos and Cambodia. Uh, and that proximity of our bases in Thailand allowed us to operate and fight what they called the secret war, stopping the, uh, the flow of men and material from North Vietnam through those neighboring countries into South Vietnam. So how many hundreds or how many airplanes were parked over there to keep them from the North Vietnamese? Uh, the, I would estimate the number is probably 50 or 60. I know 11 of them were Sky Raiders, and four of them, uh, Roger and another pilot named Jack Young, uh, Jack Young, uh, Drummond. Drummond, Jack Drummond, were able to save. So, Roger, there's the backgrounder on all of this, which, by the way, is one of the best brief backgrounds about the Vietnam War I've ever heard. <coughs> oh, that was awesome. Roger, yeah. You know, this is part of what we do here. We're trying to present some of this history because I guess most of you, if you were born when that was going on, you were awfully, you were awfully young. And so one of our goals is to not only honor veterans, which is the major reason we're here, uh, but to try to refresh people's memories or give them some memory about who did what to make sure that we could be here today and live the lives we lead and we honor these veterans every day in every way. So. Mag Roger, you're up. Thank you. And thank all of y'all for coming out here in this hot sun to listen to a little bit of history. When I started out in the uh, pilot training, I wanted to fly the A-1 terribly so, but we didn't have any left, so I took a C-123 for one year tour in Saigon, quickly volunteered for a concurrent tour to get into the A-1, and it worked out great. I flew the A-1 uh, out of NKP, and towards the end of that tour... What's NKP? Nakam Phnom. That's where we had our A-1 station. Towards the end of that tour, and this will bring you up to speed of us going to Utapau to get these airplanes. Uh, General Adderholt had contacted some of the A-1 people and said, I need some T-28 advisors. If you all want to do that, I'll send you to the Defense Language Institute to study Thai for a year and then back over to work for him. I had come back and was going to work as a T-28 advisor when uh, he introduced me to the Stoll Porter, which the Thais had uh, just acquired, and I became an advisor for that. This year is 73, and then we had 74, and then in 75 is when South Vietnam fell. During the 73-74 uh, time frame, uh, General Adderholt was working uh, behind the curtain, so to speak, with the ambassador in Cambodia and the one in uh, Vietnam. We had given them, uh, the South Vietnamese, most of our airplanes in the Vietnamization, and they had become the fourth largest air force of so over 2,000 airplanes in the world. Uh, things were going south for them, and uh, same way with the Khmer Rouge, which was approaching into Cambodia. General Adderhold came up with a plan to uh, get everybody out. Uh, my partner in crime, and I can't quite see the slides back there, but uh, if they bring up Jack Drummond, he's the one that worked with me. General Adderhold had uh, called him and called me and said, you all had flown A1s before. I need you to help me out. So uh, Cambodia was about to fall, and they did fall back in uh, early part of April. And uh, there was about 60 or 97 airplanes came out of Cambodia, mostly T-28s, into Utapau. Now, set the stage here. You had four nations, four air forces at Utapau at one time. Once Saigon fell and the South Vietnamese Air Force came into Utapau, we had the U.S. Air Force that had B-52s still there. We had the Royal Thai Air Force. We had the Cambodian Air Force and the, U and the uh, South Vietnamese Air Force and nobody could hardly talk to anybody. It, it was a Wild West show wow. beyond imagination. Wow. So my partner in crime was uh, Jack Drummond. Uh, he had a great background, although not in combat in the A-1. He had one at Eglin Air Force Base. He was a weapons tester. He worked directly for General Adderholt. That was one of the reasons General Adderholt, when he went over to Southeast Asia, he took Jack Drummond with him because he trusted him. So once he had Jack Drummond in country, and I was in country, 
and uh, Cambodia fell, he had called me and told me, he said, I need you to go down to uh, Utapau, look things over. I'm, I'm understanding that the South Vietnamese are going to try to come out of there fairly quickly, and they did on April the 29th. Before they came out, he sent me down to a little field, and it's on one of the maps. I can't quite see them, David. But anyway, there's a small grassy strip next to Cambodia called Trot, T-R-A-T. He said, check that out because a lot of the airplanes coming out of uh, Cambodia and South Vietnam are not going to have gas, like especially the UH-1s and the O-1s, and they're going to need to land. So I went down there. I found a 3,000, 4,000-foot strip. I checked it out. It was okay. I got back to Adder Holt and I said, you can tell them through your channels that there is a strip short of Utapau. Utapau was further to the west. So when Cambodia came out, it was kind of phenomenal. General Adder Holt designed the ops plan for them to leave. They literally loaded their T-28s in Phnom Penh with Mark 82s. And in doing so, they put all their families on a bus to go west to a place called Batamban. Once the families were there, the T-28s took off. They bombed the Khmer Rouge. They RTB'd into Bottom Bond. They picked up their families and put them in the back seat of the T-28, loaded up again with Mark 82s, wow. and went back out to the Khmer Rouge, bombed the Khmer Rouge, and then returned into Thailand to land. Now, that's, that's the way it all happened, and that was because Adderholt lined it out for them exactly what to do. So he not only saved their families, but he did two strikes prior to them evacuating out to Utapau. And the families were in the backseat of T-28s on yeah. bombing missions? As many as a wife and two or three kids in the backseat of a T-28. God. The whole story of this evacuation, whether it's Cambodia or Vietnam, is unbelievable. Uh, we had A-37s landing with a pilot and four people in the right seat. We had C-47s designed for 30 or 40 people landing with 150 Vietnamese people in there. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a Wild West show, believe me. So I had trot set up for them, and we were uh, evacuating people out. And uh, as we were getting them off the helicopters that would land, I was trying to check things out and see who was coming in and all, because we didn't know who was on the helicopters. And what was meaningful to me was... There was an elderly lady got off of the helicopter. She was in her Aoyai, Vietnamese Aoyai. She was about, according to my interpreter, pilot, Vietnamese pilot. He went and talked to her. She was over 90 years old. And she was carrying a plastic bag in her hands wrapped up like this, and she had tied a knot in it. And most of you or any of you that's been in Asia know that the, the Asian people carry a lot of things, food and everything, in these plastic bags. Well, she had a clear plastic bag that was filled with water. I said, well, what's in there? He came back and he said she got out of Vietnam with her goldfish. So she, that was important. The other end of the uh, spectrum was that a 17-year-old girl got off a helicopter with a four-day-old baby. Wow. So there we were. Wow. Anyway, Jack Drummond and I knew that the South Vietnamese was coming out. And we were down there looking around. And then on the 29th of April, Saigon fell. And I don't know where the slide program is up there, but anyway, I'll just tell you how it was. When the, when the uh, North Vietnamese and the uh, Viet Cong overran Saigon, it was unbelievable. People were, the South Vietnamese military was running, or Air Force was running to see if anything had any gas and just take off and go west. And so a lot of them landed on the roads. A lot of them, uh, helicopters landed in rice paddies in Thailand. Some of them made it all the way to uh, Utapau. There was approximately 165 Vietnamese aircraft there. And those were F-5s, some of them nearly brand new, A-37s, wow. uh, C-47s, AC-119s, O-1s, Hueys, etc. Well, Adderholt's plan was, he said, we're not leaving those airplanes there. And he, he was the art of the deal before the art of the deal, I'm just going to tell you. He was a, a, a real trooper, and if you have the chance to read his book, it'll be time well spent. So he sent Adderholt and I down to Utapau a little bit before the planes come out, and we were there when they were coming in. The B-52s had a 12,000-foot runway, and these planes coming in from Vietnam, they couldn't speak English. They didn't know anything other than they were needing a place to land, and we literally saw airplanes landing at both ends of the runway at the same time. C-47s coming in with an engine on fire. Uh, another airplane landing in the gear just collapsing underneath it. Well, the SAC commander there, Colonel Austin, 
had a number of people there working for him, and he had them out there with trucks and tractors and all clearing the runway. So if you can imagine this place here, and all these planes here, instead of being in a row and in order, were parked all different kind of ways, some no gear, some props bent, some wings bent up. That's the way it was, and it was just unbelievable. So when Jack Grumman and I got there, after all the A1s had landed, we went down and tried to check them out. And we found out that they were sorting the airplanes, the U.S. was, into the type of airplane there, that, that was available. They had all the A1s together and all the AC-119s, C-130s, etc. So the morning after they got through sorting, I took uh, Jack back down in the porter. And we said, well, where are the A1s? And so we got in a truck, and he took us way to the back of the, one of the runways where there was a taxiway. And in Utapau, it's very flat. It's right on the bay. So in order to build a runway and taxiways that would uphold a B-52 taxi, and they had to dig what we call in Texas some bar ditches. I mean, they had to dig some deep ditches and pound that uh, dirt up. Well, they had parked all the A1s in a row in the ditch, backed them off the taxiway in the ditch, in the grass. Two nights before we went down there to get them, uh, it had started raining. And it rained every day in the monsoon. And then there was sunshine, and it rained. So when Jack and I finally got out of the truck and we saw 11 A1s, they were literally underwater above the tire. So you go here and you look at the tire up about halfway on the strut. That's how deep the water was that they were sitting in. And so I told Jack, I said, you know, we don't even know if these hydraulics are going to work, the brakes are going to work, or anything. So we had Chief Master Sergeant Day and I think that was who it was. We asked him, said, can you get these things out of the water up here on the grass so we can look them over? And he as said, As far yeah. as you knew, were all of them flyable, or did you well, know they that? Well, they, here was the good thing. They had just flown in. And when we got them out on the grass, and we got up on the wings, started looking around, there's no checklist. There's no 781 manual talking about the condition of the airplane. The cockpits had been left open, and when I reached over into that cockpit, of Nebby 606 and pressed down on the uh, parachute seat cushion, the water came up between my fingers. So I told Jack, I said, we're not flying with this seat armed. We're leaving the pin in. So the ejection seat pin was right here at the base of the seat. So we flew those with no chance of getting out, which was fine. We left the canopies open. Wait, once that was fine? Yeah. Oh, good. good. Well, I don't know too many people that bailed out with wet silk and it opened up into a parachute. I put it that way. So we had a plan. And this was all fly by night. I hadn't flown the A1 for three years. Jack hadn't flown it for five or six years. So we're trying to put together in our mind the checklist of how to start the A1. And we started remembering over and over. I said, well, I remember we need to put the power on. We need to set the throttle about here for 1,000 RPM when it cranks up. We need the prop lever and the mixture lever up. And I said, we count 16 blades going across the nose. And after 16, it's pretty greased up. And we turn it on and go to both on the mags. And believe it or not, our memories were pretty close to correct. And they cranked up. Or you wouldn't but, be here today. <laughs> well, that's true. And there's a lot to that. We had gone over to base operations and told them, we're going to try to get in and turn the power on, see if we can find a radio that Jack and I can talk plane to plane on, and that we were going to try to uh, get them out of there. And one thing to note about the whole deal of two or 300 airplanes sitting there from three or four different countries, only four airplanes were flown out of Utapau to safety. The rest of them were put on trucks or slung out or whatever. Those four airplanes were A1s. And 606 sitting here today is one of those four airplanes. Wow. So when, when Jack and I finally decide we're going to give it a shot, we said, let's take, we had one email, e model there, 683. And I said, well, let's get in it and let's fly around and just to kind of refresh ourselves. When we got on the wings and looked in the cockpit, there was no right seat and no right stick. So that ended that conversation. So I, being a captain and him and a major, I got to fly the fat face, the single seat, big one, and he got the 332, which was a single seater. We got in there and we turned on the radios and we talked and all, and we said, well, okay, let's give it a shot. And all we had done to that airplane was put oil in it and 115, 145 avgas. That was it. We walked around and walked around. 
We were literally looking for bullet holes or damage to the airplane that it might have uh, happened when they were escaping from South Vietnam. Because Had they, they dragged these airplanes out of the water yet? Yeah, they dragged them up on the grass, and we looked around, and, you know, what can you say? The water drained out of the wheels and the brakes, and, and we were going to give it a shot no matter what. When Adderholt asked you to do something, you, you, don't, you don't argue with that man. When he initially called me about flying the A-1, I said, yes, sir, I'll do that. I said, you know, it's been three years. And he just said, young blood, do you ever drive a bicycle? I said, yes, sir. Think you can do it again? I said, yes, sir. He said, get your ass down there and get them A-1s. <laughs> and, and, and that was the whole story, believe it or not. That's leadership. Well, I'm telling you, you go with that man anywhere. So we had walked around and pre-flighted as best we could. What we soon learned was there was no de-arming at the end of the runway when the Vietnamese landed. The guns were still hot. So I told Jack, keep your finger off the trigger. You know, we, we, this is, it's an unbelievable situation to sit in an airplane you haven't flown for three years and crank it up and say, I'm going to just take it up and have some fun here. Well, it was, it was unbelievable. But anyway, we told the tower we were going to taxi out that morning with 683 and 332. And we cranked them up, and we chose the call sign Sandy 1 and Sandy 2. And just what habit, as we got out on the taxiway and turned and we started taxiing towards the parallel taxiway, there was two Jolly Greens sitting over there waiting to rescue people with their engines running. So here, after all these years, was two A1s taxiing past two Jolly Greens, which was a little emotional. Wow. So wow. we got to the end of the runway to arm and we were going to take off north to south over the ocean just in case the engine quit or whatever we could just ditch it in the ocean and try to get out we had t28 harnesses but the coke fittings fit the harnesses and the a1 so we did that and then we locked the seats and locked the harness so we couldn't fall forward but the seat pin was in so there was no ejecting like i told you so we got onto the runway and i told jack i said jack if you have to abort just let it drive off at the end of the runway. If you get on the brakes and one of them hangs up, you're going to cartwheel, and we don't know what will happen. So we, we agreed to that, and we didn't maximize the power on takeoff. They were clean birds, and so we got up at an adequate uh, Did you take set. off individually or together? Yeah, yeah, Jack took off first. And so I was behind him, and I was looking at his airplane and kind of talking to him. He had selected half flaps on takeoff, and he got down about 2,000 foot, and he said, no flaps, no flaps, because it was coming on up and ready to roll. So he popped his flaps up, and I raised mine too. And about 3,000 foot or so, you could see him start to just touch a little left, right, and then all of a sudden he was airborne. And we were going to make for sure that we got up a little ways before he sucked the gear up, and he popped the gear, and I said, the gear clean good, buddy. The gear clean good. So when he took off, we were going to exit uh, back to the east over uh, outside of Utapau and head up to Tok Lee. And he made a giant turn to the right to give me time. And I was going down and I told him, I'm off, I'm off. And I said, gear up. And so then he started his turn back to the left and I joined up on his echelon to the left and we turned out and we flew at a thousand feet. Some of the pictures are on these slides. I don't know where that show is. But I, I was up on his wing about 500 foot above him taking pictures of him flying that Vietnamese uh, A1332 up to Tok Lee. Now, Adderholt had told us to take the airplanes to Tok Lee. And the reason being was there was a huge hangar that he had built himself or had built up there. And this is no, nothing confidential. I mean, it was to hide U2s in there. If the U2s had an engine problem and had to emergency land, they could land at Tok Lee and they could put them in a hangar. So he said, I want you to put those A1s in that hangar. So there's a slide here in a minute to show that we landed in the first uh, H model, 332. We turned over to the Thai colonel there at the base. And we just uh, came down initial, just like we owned the place. We pitched out. We land, Sandy 1 on final, and Sandy 2 on final. And we touched down, taxied in, turned the keys over to that Thai colonel. And Adderholt had directed that an Army fixed wing uh, aircraft come up to Tok Lee and pick us up and take us back down to Utapau. So we got on that fixed-wing Army plane, and we were headed back to Utapau, and we're sitting up close to the bulkhead, and that Army captain flying in the left seat, he leaned back and he said, man, that's the first time I ever heard, and he was following us on the radio, 
He said, the first time I ever heard two pilots talking over the radio how to fly the airplane as they were flying the airplane. <laughs> so, and we did. The whole way up there, we said, well, we know we need to do this. We'll hold this much on final. We'll, you know. And in those days, as uh, I tell some of my best friends, like Ken, carry a little extra on final for the family, and you'll never regret it. It's hard to get when you need it if you can't get it. So anyway, they took us back down to Utapau, and it was getting late in the evening. And... The, the master sergeant had fueled the, the, the rest of the uh, airplanes, the seven, and uh, he said, they're ready to go. And I said, well, if we have a problem cranking and getting airborne, I said, it's going to be close to dark when we get up to Tok Lee. I said, we'll get it next thing in the morning. So we came out the next morning, and we were standing there next to 665, which now lives in Sevierville, Tennessee, at the uh, Tennessee Air Museum and 606, which was mine, which is right here. And it's at Cavanaugh. And I think the Mr. Jim Cavanaugh's in the crowd, and I'd like to thank you very much. Jim, are you here? Where's Jim? There he is, sir. A lot of time and effort and money uh, went into getting 606 back to where it is today, and thanks to Ken Holston and him being a captain with Delta Airlines, he finagled Delta to repaint 606 back to its original spec. So that's good. You've got an authentic A1 Sky Raider in 606. Wow. So when we got out to the last two aircraft, three, uh, 665 and 606, there comes this blue staff car screaming down the taxiway to where we were located. The door slings open, and this lieutenant colonel gets out, and he's from SAC. And so, you know, they do everything by the book, whether it's going to the restroom or whatever, it's by the book. So he comes up to us, and he said, wait a minute. He said, I got a call from uh, headquarters, and they said, they heard you flew these airplanes. They want to know, when did you get current? You, you can't fly these airplanes. When did you get current in these A1s? And Jack and I looked at each other and looked back at him and said, yesterday. He, t he didn't say a word. He got back in his car and headed out. So we just got in those A1s. And How many of you active duty were in SAC? Any of you? Yeah, a few. Nothing against SAC, but that's the way they operate. Well, the I way. just want to identify my old gang. Somebody. Yeah. And uh, by the way, I know there's some people here visiting today that worked on the A1. Whether you were weapons troops, gas troops, whatever you were, radio, would you raise your hand? I'd like to thank you. Yeah. Also, Roger, would you identify John Goldenbaum's over here yeah, with two of your this is, Sandy th guys? This is uh, a little unusual, maybe the first time since we came back from Vietnam. When you go into the A-1 squadron, you fly on the wing for a couple of flights, and then you're okay to go up and be Hobo 1, they call it, and you lead a flight of two. After you fly Hobo missions for a while, they upgrade you to Sandy Wingman, whether it's Sandy 4 or Sandy 2. And after you've flown a few Sandy missions and they got a lot of faith in you, they upgrade you to Sandy 1. Sandy 1 is in charge of the whole SAR force, all the Sandys, the Jollies, the Ford Air Controllers. He communicates with the AC-130, Kingbird, I mean, he is in charge of the SAR force. It just so happened that Don, uh, John Goldenbaum, John Ralston, and Cliff Groves and I were in the same flight, and we were all Sandy Ones, qualified flight leads. I'd like these guys to stand up. Yeah. Stand up. There you go. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. It was a, it was really an honor for you to fly the SPAD and go and pick people up. It, that was a, just the greatest. So when we got uh, uh, 332, I mean uh, 685 and 606 off, and we landed at Tok Lee, we pitched out again and landed. And as I saw Goldie rolling out on the runway, I just jokingly said to him, are you down? He said, yeah, I just landed and I'm turning base. And I said, well, I guess that makes me flying the last day one in the U.S. Air Force. And I was on base turn. That was a joke. 
But I do enjoy it so much. And when we came out of there, the State Department had found out what we had done. And they said, you cannot say that you stole those airplanes from the North Vietnamese. You can say that you repositioned previously U.S. owned property. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way that was. And they gave Adderholt a hard time. And while Adderholt was running the show, he stole every F-5, every A-37. He took a bread truck with his crew of people with a settling torch and went up and down the line. He cut the guns out of the AC-119 gunships. He cut the dash out of a lot of airplanes that he couldn't do anything with. So if the North Vietnamese were coming to claim their spoils, they were going to get junk. They didn't get jack, except a bunch of wore out broke airplanes. So Adderholt was just unbelievable. So in kind of winding it up, when I got through with my tour in 75, he called me in his office and he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know anything but close air support. And I, he said, well, how about an A7? And they were kind of coming online. And I said, sir, that'd be great. So he got me an A7 to Davis Monthan. After the A7, I moved to Myrtle Beach in the A7. Then I transitioned to the A10. So I've just been attack, attack, attack below 5,000 foot all my life. And uh, I, I just enjoyed that. Was in 24 years, and I, and I don't regret a second of it, especially flying 606. When I got back in 75, I, for some reason, I was at Eglin Air Force Base doing something. And I'd heard that all the refugees, a lot of them, had been relocated to Eglin. They were out on the grass in these 50-man uh, Army tents. And I went over there, and I'm not sure why. But I went over there to see those guys that had come back. So I ask, uh, do you have these, these uh, Vietnamese refugees segregated by aircraft? And they said, yes. And uh, so I said, well, where are the A-1 pilots? And they gave me a tent number. And there was a lot of tents. So I went down there to that tent. And I walked in. And here's about 30 or 40 cots in that tent. It's hot. In typical fashion for Asian pilots and all, they're in their underwear and T-shirt. They're playing cards on their cots. And that's all they had. So I sat in there and talked to them a little bit. I said, you know, I, I flew the A-1 in, in, in Saigon for a while. Or not in Saigon, but I saw your A-1 in Saigon. And I got to fly the A-1. And then I was involved in you getting out of, out of, out of Vietnam. And so I, the next day, I went back and I said, what do I need to do to take one of these guys with me? And that lady sitting there, she turned this piece of paper around and said, sign here. That was about what it took. So I signed off on possibly doing that. So I went to the tent, and I found this one that I liked, this guy I was talking to. I said, you know, you don't know me. I don't know you. But we both flew the A-1. If you want to get out of here, I'll take you with me to live with me. <laughs> he talked to his uh, buddies. So okay, I'll go. So I took him in the car. We went straight to the BX. I got a cart and the biggest suitcase. We loaded up, and we headed across country to Tucson, Arizona, where he lived with me for a year. I got him a job at H-E-B, stock and shells. I got him a checking account. Bank of America. Got him enrolled in an English class. After a year, he and some of his, some, some of his buds wanted to head out. I said, okay. I blessed them. They had bought a car. We went to the bank, got all his money out, got him traveler's checks. Shook his hand, and he headed out. And that kind of summed up my tour and my career and what I wanted to do. Well, wow. hmm. yep. Were you able to keep track of him? Could you keep track of him at all, or he I tried you? to. Uh, I tried to track him down a few times. I'd heard it. Believe it or not, he went to Minnesota, and I think there's a lot of Vietnamese people in Minnesota, and he's probably 40 years plus now, so he's, he's well on his way doing something. But this whole thing happened 40-something years ago, and 
19, five and six May, 1975. And probably this story wouldn't have come about had the Smithsonian Air and Space Magazine not published a, a story about the fall of Saigon. It was labeled Escape to Utapau. You can Google it. And it told the whole story about how it all happened, except some of the minor details I told you about were left out, about Jack and I. So uh, I got the phone calls, and they said, well, where are those airplanes? And tell us what happened and all this. And we didn't know anything, so this is 40-plus years. So I started checking around, and thanks to Ken Holston, he calls me one day, and he said, Youngblood, there's only three Jack Drummonds in the United States, and I didn't know where Jack had gone. And he said, guess what? One of them's in Round Rock, Texas. Well, Round Rock, Texas is 40 miles from my home. So I call him up, and believe you me, when he answered the phone, I knew I had the right number. And he said, hello. And I said, Jack. And he said, Youngblood. And I, that was Whoa. pretty much it. So after 40 years, we got back together. Now, he had severe diabetes, and he was confined to a wheelchair. But thanks to Mr. Cavanaugh and the Cavanaugh Flight Museum, in 2018, they did a weekend show about the 606 and there are other e-models there and it's a great place if you ever get to texas around dallas go to the cavanaugh flight museum and visit it was well worth your time so we had this show jack in his wheelchair with diabetes rented a van and drove three and a half hours from round rock to dallas to sit in the hangar and we could tell the story one time about how we got those airplanes out of there. And then he drove back, and in late 2018, his dialysis machine failed him, and he went into hospice, and he passed. So the Adderholt is gone, Charlie Day is gone, Drummond's gone, and, and I'm it, and I'm not looking to leave. So right. that's it. Ken? All of this was happening when you were in grade school. What is it like for you to sit here and know him and work with him now, fly this airplane? What's this experience like for you? Uh, that is hard to put into words. You know, I built models of Sky Raiders as a boy. I read about these guys, and now to be friends with them and to share in this history, is, it's really hard to put into words. Uh, the airplane is just a joy to fly, and to get to know someone like Roger and, and Goldie and Cliff to know the history that you're carrying with you. Some, I, I made the analogy, and not to be too uh, you know, touchy-feely, but you're flying the airplane, and you just feel like you have hundreds of eyes looking over your shoulder because you're, you're carrying... If this airplane could talk, you know, the, the missions it flew, the people it saved, uh, or, and I'm sure there were, there were certainly heartbreak missions where things didn't work, and, uh, and that's, the, that's war. Um, but to be able to honor the Vietnam veterans now, they, their uh, recognition's a little overdue. And the fact that we're able to show the airplane in its original colors, tell the story, and have Roger here tell it from the horse's mouth, uh, it's history. It, if we don't remember our history, we're doomed to repeat it. Amen. And once again, here is Roger and his colleagues and thousands, tens of thousands over a couple of hundred years, uh, millions of Americans have put their lives on the line so we could be here and live the way we do today. So gratitude to all of you, gentlemen. And ladies. Thank you. So Sam, Sam Bass, who's a 50-year safe flyer with his tens of thousands of hours. And by the way, Ken has almost 20,000 hours, too, yeah, right. uh, as a pilot. Sam's going to come out and talk with these guys about the airplane. Um, John, thank you for being with us there. John Cliff. So, John Ralston. Sam, take over. Good to see you here. Yes, sir. Hello. We're we here. Tell us a little bit about the, the design of the airplane. What was its purpose when it was designed? Well, as we alluded to uh, earlier in the presentation, uh, at one point we thought we were going to have to invade the home islands of Japan. And so the airplane was designed to replace the Dauntless dive bomber. And uh, it, the Sky Raider, and I think the Bearcat, both to me are the pinnacle of the World War II technology. 
people that know antique airplanes know that the gear handles aren't always in good spots and, and whatnot. There's no ergonomics. But this airplane has a lot of ergonomics. They actually sent Douglas representatives out in the Pacific and asked pilots and mechanics, what do we need to do with this next new airplane uh, to make it user friendly and pilot friendly? Well, what is the hours we were talking about range, not in distance, but in hours loitering range, for instance? Uh, the internal fuel on the airplane is 380 gallons, and if you just want to use a round number of 100 gallons an hour, that's 3.8 hours to flame out on internal fuel. And then these drop tanks that you see here are each 150 gallons, uh, so that you can add increments in range. You know, the airplane empty is about 12,500 pounds, but the gross is 25,000 pounds, so it, in essence, can carry its own weight in stuff, which you can divvy up between ordnance and fuel. So uh, it, not uncommon for missions in Vietnam to go out to the eight-hour mark, if need be. Well, speaking of armament, what, what is the armament on this airplane? Of course, it, I'm sure it varies depending on its mission. But what, what's typical armament for it? Uh, in Vietnam, of course, the four 20 millimeter cannons in the wings, and they typically carried also a 7.62 minigun, which show you a replica here uh, on the stub pylon. Uh, they also carried a lot of cluster munitions, which are the kind of the equivalent of grenades all packed into dispensers, uh, white phosphorus bombs, rockets for both marking and high explosives. Uh, and then, of course, it could carry hard bombs, napalm, mines, rescue kits. Uh, the beauty of the airplane is if it would hang on there, it could carry it. Well, of all of these that are built, how many do you think are still flying? The number is less than 20. I don't recall the exact, but uh, there are less than 20 flying. Uh, of the H model here, only two fly in the world, and it's thanks to Roger Youngblood that the airplanes were saved uh, the J model, which was the last version, none fly. Okay, how about flying the airplane? Now, of all the airplanes you've flown, you've got a vast knowledge here of airplanes you've flown in the Air Force and in the airlines. How does this compare? I would love flying this airplane. It's such an honest, stable machine. Uh, back in the day with the high-octane fuels, the uh, manifold pressure was limited at uh, 56 inches. Today, with 100 octane, uh, we're limited to 49, and we uh, applied a across-the-board limit, actually, of 45 just for engine longevity. However, we fly the airplane with no armor and no armament, so I think uh, the way it handles on reduced power and reduced weight is probably somewhat similar to what it was like uh, in combat. Very stable, very well harmonized. Um, Amazing what the designers did. Well, here we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, all done with slide rules. And again, what an amazing thing that the engineering minds of America did. Uh, they decided to put hydraulic assist ailerons in, but, but manual elevator and rudder, yet the whole airplane just feels just easy and naturally harmonized. Well, thanks to the Kavanaugh Museum. Now, you get to fly this around the country. You as an individual, what does it mean to you to be able to present this to the public? It's a lot. Um, when I, as a quick aside, when we decided to repaint the airplane and put it in its accurate colors, I went in search of experts, with the quotation marks, experts to help me confirm the fonts of the stencils and, and all this other stuff. And I found out that there really weren't any. So uh, what do they say, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, and I became the the uh, Sky Raider expert on that. So to be able to, to, to be a conduit to history, uh, to get to know Roger personally, and to be able to help relate the stories, share it with the public, and in particular because Vietnam, uh, America was wanted to put all things Vietnam behind it. And uh, in the years since Desert Storm, we've done such a better job of embracing the Vietnam veterans and the Vietnam era to make sure that uh, as citizens, we don't forget the price of freedom. Amen. Okay, thank you for your info. And I'd like to add right here that Roger Youngblood has some pictures and they are all about the uh, Sky Raider. And if you'll see the building over here, it says Warbird Merchandise. He'll be over here right after the end of this and he has given these pictures away and he's signing them for you. It's quite an, going to be quite an honor for you to get that. There's also, we have a large selection of books and memorabilia over there for the Warbirds. 
speaking of the Warbirds, you don't have to be a member to be out here, obviously, and you don't have to have a Warbird to be a member of the Warbirds. So we'd love to have you in here and we'll share our what little knowledge we have. And thank you all for coming. And thanks all you people for coming. We really do appreciate it.